Good morning. That was kind of weak. Good morning. There you go. Get those vocal cords to work in this morning. It's good to see you here at Trinity Baptist Church this morning. We're glad that you're here. Let's uh, begin our time with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the time of Bible study where we can come together and we can look at your word and we can discuss it and we can let you lead us in it and teach us through it what you want us to know. Thank you for our teachers that uh, spend time preparing and then presenting the lesson each and every Sunday morning. Thank you for those who come and take part so that they can grow in their faith. Father, uh, we just thank you for the beauty of the day that you've given us. We ask you, Lord, to be here as we uh, worship together this morning. Father, be with those who are not doing well, those who aren't feeling well this morning, wherever they may be. We ask you to bring healing to them. You know who they are. You know what their situation is. Help us, Lord, to minister to them as their brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, uh, we just at now ask that you lead and guide in all that we say and do this morning. We pray that uh, because we've been in your house today, that it will make a difference in our life and that you will change us in some way to make us more like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, announcements-wise the, for the week, uh, Wednesday evening will be regular Wednesday activities this week. As far as today goes, it's deacon training this evening at Okarchi First Baptist Church. That begins at 5 o'clock. If you want to go with us from the church here tonight, to you guys that will be part of that, we're going to leave about 440. So be here ready to leave at that time. Our Heart of the Warrior study for men begins tomorrow evening. That's tomorrow evening at uh, 615, and we're going to meet up in the youth room. Uh, for our first meeting anyway, we may meet somewhere else. Uh, after that so meet here at the youth room tomorrow evening at 6 15 run to about 7 30 the next week begin or the week of september 4th through 10th uh, will be the week of prayer for a state missions offering so keep that in mind as well our goal is one thousand dollars this year and uh, that's everything that our oklahoma baptists do through your giving and uh, it's a it's a great offering and it carries on a lot of various mission efforts here in our state. And then we have scheduled revival with evangelist Craig Hobbs. He'll be here the week of October 2nd through the 5th, so keep that in mind. Be praying toward that. I want you to think, what if God was, uh, what if God said, I'm not sending rain until Trinity Baptist Church has revival? And I don't mean just services. I mean in our hearts. What if he said, I'm not sending any rain until those people get their hearts where I want them to be. Uh, we might have a, hopefully we'd have rain tomorrow, right? Or evening today. So let's let revival start as soon as it can in our hearts. And keep that in mind. Be praying toward that uh, coming up in October. Brother Dave, we got a Sunday school report this morning. Brother Rod, there used to be a television show called Hawaii 5 -0 -0 50 <laughs> Yeah, I'll take it. All right, kids, come on down. Is it, is it not kids' time? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Are we going to sing first? That's fine with me. We can sing. Go ahead. Yeah. You're throwing me off today, trying changing things up, boy. It's good. Yeah, that's fine. I'm good. Encroaching on my time on the stage, Mom. Come on. Uh, hymn number 339, Standing on the Promises.
promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God to 585 count your And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burning? Grace, grace, 
Miss Robin needs to watch the bulletin, doesn't she? She needs to read it. I don't know. Is this on? Oh, my goodness. You guys, there were some good pictures of you up there as we went on our scavenger hunt to Walmart on Wednesday night. You guys were fast at finding all of those things. Listen to this verse uh, from Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 6. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the sin or the iniquity of all of us to fall on him. Jesus took on all the bad things that you're ever going to do and all the bad things that I'm ever going to do and of all the things that we've done in the past. And he took them and he paid the price so you don't have to. Isn't that a good thing to hear? That you don't have to pay for your sin? Jesus did it for you. And uh, the good, funny thing about this is it talks about us, all of us like sheep have gone astray. How many of you have ever watched sheep? You ever seen any sheep? Did you go to the fair? Did you, did you see some sheep there? You didn't? Well, when they're trying to train them and show, that some of the girls at school told me it's really tough sometimes. You really kind of have to hit them with your knee, and you kind of have to make sure they stay where they're supposed to because they'll just wander anywhere. I want you to watch this video of this little sheep, and this shows particularly how we are as Christians and as God's people. Sometimes we just stray and do our own thing. Look, at he's stuck, isn't he? But he's trying to pull him out. Ouch. There he goes. All right. Good sheep. Whoops. <laughs> and it starts all over again. Not only does that verse say there that we are like sheep, but there's one over in the New Testament, and it says this. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains? And go search for the one that is straying. God loves you. And even when you've done wrong things and you've wandered off and you jump back right where you were before, he will leave the 99 and come search for you. He pursues you. Jesus wants to know you. He wants to teach you and show you the right way. And so just like sheep, when we mess up, God is there pursuing us. You need to know that. There's nothing that you can do to get his forgiveness except, except what he did for you on Calvary. That's good news, guys. That's good news. Let's have a word of prayer, okay?
Father, we thank you so much that even as um, silly sheep and how we do our own thing, that you sent your one and only son to take on all of our sin and so that we don't have to pay for it, God. We thank you for that type of love. God, please help us to listen to you and to follow you and not run off and try to do our own thing. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.
called Heroes in Heaven.
guys stand? This will be our offertory. Great is thy faithfulness. Bollinger, would you come up here a minute? He's not, he didn't know I was going to do this. But. Let me remind you as we give our tithes and offerings this morning that we have plates here at the front and also there's a plate back there at the table at the back if that's closer to you as you uh, give your offerings today. I'd just like to ask Brother Kyler to come and lead us in prayer this morning if he would and I uh, appreciate you so much. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the wonderful weather. Uh, we pray that your hand of healing would be upon all those who aren't feeling well. Uh, we pray that you'd strengthen them. You'd give them rest today. We pray that you would just bless this offering, that you'd use it to your honor and glory, that you'd speak through Rod, and that you'd open our hearts, Holy Spirit, to what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
evening. If you would, turn with me to the book of Philippians this morning. Philippians chapter 1. Today we're beginning a series in the book of Philippians. So before we begin, uh, the title of the sermon is Making the Best of Stress. And we're going to look at what the book of Philippians says about stress. And uh, in the moment here on the screen, in just a minute when I tell you to, Dylan, we're going to project a picture here on the screen. And uh, I want to get what it is, is. It's a stress test. Okay. I want to give you a little stress test here. And so when we project this picture on the screen, it is a picture of two dolphins jumping out of the water. And a study at the Institute of... Uh, stress found that although most people when they see this picture they see two identical dolphins people who are under a lot of stress see different things they see differences in these two identical dolphins so Dylan if you would project that picture at this time all right all right, now if you saw more than a couple of differences in those two dolphins, you might need a vacation. Anybody see any differences there? There you go. Well, stress. We're going to talk about stress, anxiety, that sort of thing in this series. And uh, stress is part of life. We know that anxiety, that stress is going to be felt in a person's life. Everybody experiences it in one way or another. Uh, the only ones who are not experiencing, experiencing stress are those who are no longer alive. And so uh, statistics and surveys recently tell us that people are experiencing stress at a much higher level than even just 20 years ago. Much higher levels. According to the ERLC, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, it says, much needed attention has been drawn to the spike in mental health concerns experienced by children and teens in recent years, especially in the aftermath of COVID-19. A review of 29 studies conducted during the pandemic reported doubling of rates of child and adolescent anxiety and depression. And so we're talking about kids from the age of 3 to 17. 3 to 17, a doubling. Almost across the board, at all ages, there is an increase in those who are experiencing anxiety and stress in their life. College and university students uh, report a spike in their difficulty in dealing with anxiety as well. Medication uses up uh, quite a bit. Really, and that's not always bad because medication can be necessary in dealing with certain things. And However, the self-medicating in the form of alcohol and illegal drugs is also on the rise and rampant, you might say, and that is not good. Now, not all stress is bad. Some situations put stress upon us. And uh, that stress can actually help us to deal with life in a better way. For instance, the stress that is put upon a person in, in sports or some kind of a challenging task like putting together one of those thousand piece puzzles we looked at the other day or helping people solve a problem of some sort or uh, all of those things can, can actually be a, a wonderful experience even though they create a certain amount of stress and anxiety in a person's life. Try to imagine life completely void of stress. Be kind of, actually be kind of boring, wouldn't it? If you didn't have anything that got you just a little bit anxious or uptight or excited about things. Uh, but when our stress level gets too high, it zaps our strength and even it overwhelms us sometimes. You know, sometimes stress is simply a symptom of, of life that has gone bad, that stuff that happens to us in life, unemployment or health issues or uh, relationship problems or injustice or financial concerns or conflict, you know. And then other times stress 
exists more in our minds maybe than in our situation in the form of worry and fear and anxiety. The Apostle Paul, we know, uh, if you know about Paul and you've read in the New Testament, you know that he was no stranger to stress in his life. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he tells us a little bit about his life right here in verses 25 through 29. Listen to this. You don't have to turn there and, and see if maybe this would cause some stress in your life. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked at night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, and in the wilderness, in the sea, and among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all of the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do, and I do not burn with indignation. He says, now notice stress here in the life of the Apostle Paul. It was not only physical, but he had stress and he had great concerns even for other people especially for the places where he had taken the gospel, the churches that he had been to and that he had places where churches had sprung up and started. That caused him some uh, bit of stress in his life, and that's what happens. Stress occurs when you care about other people. You know, as we look at this letter uh, to the church in Philippi, we, uh, we get to see that even in... Uh, the spiritual advice, that information, and the spiritual advice that he gives us that stress is a part of life. It's going to be there. And so he writes about it in order to help others deal with their life as well. Now keep in mind that what he wrote in this letter, that he wrote it while he was in prison. That couldn't have been any stress, could it? And uh, probably in Rome, where he'd spent the last two years of his life before his death, there had to be stress. There had to be turmoil in his life as he did, had no idea whether he was going to be released or whether he was going to be put to death. Yet in this letter, as always, Paul seems more stressed about the future of the church somewhere else than he was with his own concern. The people in Philippi were living in a pagan culture where Greeks and Romans would probably... Uh, think that they were very strange people. The Jews would probably directly oppose them as they did almost everywhere they went. And uh, Paul himself had been imprisoned here in Philippi. You remember that that was the jail where he was at uh, when the jail doors were thrown open by the violent earthquake and Paul and Silas remained uh, with the jailer. And you remember that he asked them what he must do to be saved. So Paul is no stranger to uh, stress, and neither are the people in Philippi. He alludes to the stress that the Philippian Christians felt from non-believing Greeks, for instance, in verses 29 and 30 here in, ver in chapter 1, when he says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. So he, he sees their stress. He sees their troubles. And uh, uh, yet a greater source of stress for Paul was not what he was enduring in prison, but what uh, was occurring inside the church. In chapter 2, Paul addresses the selfish ambition and the vain conceit of some in the church. That had to be causing him stress and also stress in the church. In chapter 4, he's more specific, and he pleads with two women in the church. He tells them, you two need to get along. You two need to get on the same page. Paul had reason for concern as the church was in danger of losing its focus on Jesus Christ. And he was basically the spiritual father of the church at Philippi. He had, he had founded it. He, was, he had established that church, and it was like a child to him. And as he saw it, it was like... His child was in trouble, and so that caused him some anxiety, you might think, and some stress. 
And so the letter that he writes to the church is a lesson on how to handle stress and the stresses of life. It's a letter shaped by uh, a mature faith in Christ and purified in the, the furnace of challenges and spiritual growth. So we see here in the first part of the letter that Paul takes a gentle approach and he encourages these Christians here in Philippi to make the best of stress. Make the best of stress. Let's look here in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you, all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, Inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, and that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Well, let's look at this passage and get to know what Paul teaches us and tells us about how to make the best of stress. You know, stress is just, that's what it is for, for everybody. There's no changing it. Sometimes... Uh, it's, it's really tough. It's definitely uh, not good to have too much. So let's quickly show you three ways to make the best of the stress that you do have in life. Because it's going to come, Paul says. In verses 9 through 11, he tells how he prays for good to come out of their stress. So he's saying we can make the best of this stress that you're going through uh, there together. And uh, how does he begin? He begins with prayer. Because prayer is a great stress reliever. And his prayer for them as they read it had to be a, a relief for them as they look at it as well. He tells them, first of all, to remember to make stress a learning experience. You know, there are some things that can only be learned by going through them. Some things can only be learned by experiencing them them in your life. Stressful situations can teach us a lot about ourselves. They can teach us a lot about other people. For instance, Mark Twain said, a man who carries a cat by the tail learns something he can learn in no other way. Think about that. Stressful situations can teach us a lot. They can reveal a lot about uh, maybe things that we didn't know were there before. For instance, Think about the stress of the drought that it has caused on various places. And maybe some of you saw the news article on TV last week where because of the stress in down around Dallas in the Fort Worth area that the lake levels were so low and dried up that it revealed hidden in the dried up riverbed of the Paluxy River near Fort Worth, Texas, uh, dinosaur prints. The, the stress of the drought revealed something they didn't know was there. And uh, stress can do that. Stress can reveal things we don't realize about ourselves. It can reveal anger and insecurity or a depraved nature of some sort that is irritable and unethical and self-centered. When, when, you know, when we get under stress, we, do all, we react in all sorts of ways. And sometimes when we look at how we react, we see that it's not good. And it can teach us something about ourselves. It might expose unresolved issues from the past. Or maybe it could show us some unrecognized fears that we didn't even realize we had about the future. But it might also reveal something that is hidden that is beautiful about ourselves or someone else. It can reveal a strength within us 
that maybe we didn't realize that we had. In verse 9, Paul speaks of love that abounds in knowledge and discernment. In knowledge and discernment. Stress can teach us, for instance, what true love really is. The love of a parent for a child is simple when that baby first a lot, uh, arrives and little Summer is here this morning somewhere. Was she, is she in here right now? You want to hold her up? For, no, you don't have to hold her up. <laughs> there she is, that sweet little girl. It's home and well and we're happy she's here. But, uh, you know, it's easy, you know, when a, when a little child arrives that that stress is, you know, the, it kind of comes to fruition and, oh, she's here, or he's here, and they're beautiful, and it's a wonderful thing, unless they get sick right there at the beginning or something happens. But it goes deeper than that when you, the parent is up all night with that little one when they become ill and uh, has to, or maybe for the parent that has to confront a teenager that is, going through a rebellious stage or maybe they're talking back or they get home late or something like that. Uh, love between a husband and a wife isn't fully known until the stresses that they go through as they have to deal with their first disagreement or uh, as they endure sickness or talk about their financial difficulties or things like that. Stress reveals things to us and gives us knowledge and discernment about our self and our situation. Paul says we need to let these issues that though they may be causing us stress teach us about ourselves and let it change us for good. In verse 10 he said, he says this, so that you may approve the things that are excellent. Stress reveals those things that are, that are good within us and teach us those ways that are excellent. In other words, in the New Living Translation, that same verse says, For I want you to understand what really matters. So stress can clarify our values. It can teach us things about ourselves and other people. And it, he can, it can help you see what really matters and what uh, really is important in life. If we never had stress, we might not ever recognize that some things are really important. If we're being pulled in many different directions and we're always on the run it can be an opportunity that forces us to decide what's really important in our life when we realize i'm doing too much and i've got to slow down now i got to choose what i cut out and what i keep stress can teach us hard lessons about the value of honesty and truth it can teach us that we can rely only on god and not on our on our own abilities and on our own wealth. It can teach us that we can't control everything in our life, especially other people. We can't do that. Ironically, Paul's not, he's not trying to lessen their stress. He doesn't really say anything about that. But he gently urges them to face the root of the problem that might be causing the stress within them and within the church. And when you do that, that might be painful. That might cause some inner stress itself as you face the root problems. But in the end, it results in a deeper love. It results in more harmonious relationships uh, in the church and the joy of pleasing God in our life, regardless of what comes our way. So when stress comes, we need to see it as a learning experience. Secondly, uh, he, he teaches us to make stress a growing experience. In verse 6, he describes the experience of every Christian. He says, he, talking about God, he says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. See, we are continually growing in Christ. And when stress comes, uh, we can grow through it as well. It can help us to grow. Stress challenges our superficial faith. It teaches us where our faith is weak and it can bring us even to a crisis of faith. It might teach us, well, what do I really believe about God? What do I really believe about God's Word? You believe that it's important uh, to live by godly priorities and it can teach you and help you to learn what to do when you have difficult choices to make in life. 
You believe in grace and truth, but how do you do that when you have to deal, for instance, with a difficult person at work? You say you trust in God, but what do you do that shows that you trust Him when all of the, the props are knocked out from under you, when you yourself don't have anything left to rely upon, and all you, all you have is God Himself? If you want to have strong moral values, then know this, that your values are clarified and strengthened when it costs you to live by them. See, our faith can grow in stress. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 8 and 9, he says, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the, ter about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, Paul says, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. You see, even Paul learned that through stressful experiences that eventually uh, they can teach us to quit relying upon our own strength and begin to rely on God. In Romans chapter 5, verses in verse 3, Paul gives his personal testimony. He says, We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering does what? It produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope that does not put us to shame, a, a hope that does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That's what it can do for us. And so, we need to make stress a growing experience in our life. If you talk to any uh, older Christian, a person who is mature in their faith, you will find that often their faith and character has grown most through those difficult times of their life. And then finally, Paul says, make stress a fruitful experience. Look at verse 11. Paul prays that as they learn and they grow, that they will what? They will be filled with the fruit of of righteousness the fruit of righteousness in other words it produces the character of Christ within you dealing with stress in a godly way produces the fruit of righteousness in your life and righteousness rises to the surface in a Christian in times of crisis or it should in an ethical dilemma or financial stress, righteousness will come to the surface in the life of a true Christian. You see, stress has a way of revealing the fruit of the Spirit in our life. It can only be seen, it can only be there if the Holy Spirit resides in us. So people who don't really know Christ, when stress hits their life, it doesn't produce the same result. Stress has a way of revealing who the sheep are and who the goats are. Talked about sheep this morning already. David in Psalm 15 describes a righteous person this way. He says, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, and who keeps an oath even when it hurts. It reveals that kind of righteousness within us. In a conflict at work, work or in the, in the family, humility and grace and truth bear fruit in our life. Forgiveness and consistency in doing what is right changes the environment around us as Christians. In a stress-filled world, there are people who are seeking only their own selfish protection and benefit but when christians enter this situation righteousness shines brightly for everyone to see when people see how we handle stress when they see how we handle sickness and loss with the help of god in our life they notice that they see the fruit of righteousness in our life and that was true for paul that was true for paul in prison in uh, Philippians chapter 1 here, verses 12 through 14, look at what he says. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me 
have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You see, the palace guard that surrounded Paul and guarded Paul, they weren't going to church. They weren't church people. They weren't synagogue people. They're not reading uh, Paul's uh, joyful Christian blog here that he has written to other churches and to the church. They're not reading that stuff. But they were sitting there with Paul, who was under house arrest, day by day, observing how he was handling the stress that he was under, and they saw Christ in how he lived. And that's how people and what people need to see in us when we go through stress as well. You see, unbelievers are not too impressed with how we're living when everything's going great, when everything's going fine, when we've got everything that we need. That doesn't impress them too much, but they're more likely to see Christ in us when we're going through hard times. Those hard times can be our opportunity to share Christ with them. The Christians in Rome, they came there to visit Paul. And they were so inspired by how he was handling his imprisonment that they did what? They courageously went out and continued to spread the gospel that he was sitting in prison for. They were willing to risk it and go and share their faith. So you see, stress doesn't have to be bad. It doesn't have to lead to bad results. With Christ, we can learn, and we can grow, and we can shine as lights in a dark and stressful life. And as we come this morning now to a time of reflection, to a time of commitment in our life, know that God invites us to come to Him with our anxieties, casting them on Him and His shoulders because He cares for us this morning. As the church... We should be a refuge for those who are weighed down with cares. We should be leading kids, adults alike, to find peace in their life that only comes through Christ when they endure stressful situations in their life. The circumstances of this chaotic world that we live in continually tempt us as Christians to be consumed with worry. But as we seek to help and equip not just ourselves, but to, to seek and equip others who are struggling as well, we can help them to deal with their stress in a, in a Christ-like way as well. John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's stand as we pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that you would let it teach us how to deal with stress and to learn through it. May we grow through it. May we produce the fruit of righteousness. May we let it produce the fruit of righteousness within our lives. And now, Lord, as we come to this time of commitment and invitation, we just ask you, Lord, to just speak to our hearts as you already have been. Help us to learn how to deal with the things that come in our life and realize that you intend for those things, uh, Lord, to, to grow us and to uh, be used for good in our life. Father, if there's anyone here this morning who needs to trust in Christ, May this be the time that they choose to do so. Father, may if we need to recommit our lives to Christ, we can do that as well today. Whatever you've laid on the hearts of those who are here this morning, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would be their leader and their guide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.